You may be seated. Amen. The Great Wall of China is without a doubt one of the historic landmarks of all time, stretching some 5,500 miles across China. It really was an amazing feat when you think about it. It started uh, under construction in the 200s and went through the Ming Dynasty in the 1600s and for years provided protection for that border from outside foes to come into China. Many people have gone there. It's a great tourist attraction. But in recent years, the Great Wall has fallen into disrepair. There are sections of it that are falling down. There are steps that have eroded to the point where it's just barely a visible path. Ledges have fallen off. In 2005, the Chinese government began an effort to rebuild the Great Wall. I was reading about one particularly challenging section, a 12-mile section that goes through the mountains and over cliffs, and it is impossible to get modern equipment into that area. And so beginning at 6 o'clock in the morning, mules carrying 450 pounds of bricks walk 10 hours a day back and forth, literally carrying the bricks to the workers who in old school fashion, hand by hand, are rebuilding that 12-mile section of the wall. Really amazing. But even a more important feat happened in ancient Jerusalem years ago. It was the rebuilding of the ancient walls around the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah tells the story in his book, Nehemiah. We find it in the Old Testament, Ezra, and then Nehemiah. And it is an incredible story of rebuilding. You may be thinking, well, Howard, what does rebuilding an ancient wall have to do with me today? Well, it has everything. You see, walls symbolize protection. Ancient cities without walls were open to wild animals and marauders and thieves and bandits and invading armies. No protection. Symbolically in Scripture, we have a divine wall of protection. We read in the book of Proverbs chapter 24, and I want to read in verses 30 and 31. I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. The wall had come into disrepair because of a lack of discipline, because of apathy, because of laziness. The wall was in disrepair. Turn over one page to chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 28. Like a city whose walls are broken is a person who lacks self-control. So let me ask you this question this morning. What is the condition of your spiritual walls? As we look at 2020 and as we reflect back on 2019, what is the condition of your spiritual walls? Are there cracks in your walls? Are there breaches where the enemy, Satan, has come in and got a foothold in your life? Are there sections that are in disrepair and need rebuilding? Listen, rebuilding is a part of a victorious life. None of our lives are perfect. We are all flawed. We are failure. We've all sinned to come short of the glory of God. And there are times in our lives when we need to rebuild. What is it that you need rebuilding? Is it a marriage? Is it a family relationship? Do you need rebuilding some of the disciplines in your life of prayer and Bible study? Do you need to rebuild um, your relationship with Jesus Christ that has fallen in disrepair? Nehemiah is for you. I invite you to join us on this journey to rebuild. But as we begin this journey, and before we even get into the text, 
I want us to bow and pray and seek the master rebuilder, Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And God, as we come before you humbly on this first Sunday of 2020, Lord, we just, we just confess to you that all of us, in some way, Lord, we need your rebuilding touch. We need healing. We need revitalization. Lord, I don't know what's going on in all the people's lives here, but I'm sure that there's some here who have areas where the wall is down and where they're in rubble. No one else may know, but Lord, there needs to be rebuilding. And God, I pray that through your word and through your spirit, as we look into Nehemiah, that you would use this marvelous book in our lives to help us to rebuild so that we can be strong and protected from the enemy and we can be revitalized and bring revival to our world and to our land. God, we trust you. We look to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. This first message I've entitled simply Rebuild Square One. If you're sitting in the rubble of... of of disrepaired walls in some area of your life where Satan has come in and, and got a stronghold in your life, and you would say, man, I never believed I would have been here. I never believed that this would have happened to me. I never believed in, in all my life that I would have given in to this. And you're in need of rebuilding. Then Nehemiah is for you. Let me quickly give you the setting. In 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian army had come in. They defeated Jerusalem. There had been years of rebellion by the people of God. They had disobeyed God. They had broken his law. They had spurned the prophets, and God judged them through the Babylonian army. And in 586 B.C., the city was defeated, the walls were torn down, and the gates were burned. Years had gone by. Well over 70 years had gone by. There had been thousands of people carried off to captivity in Babylon. There had been a changing of the guards. In a great feat, the Persians knocked off the Babylonians that sent literally shockwaves through the known world. And those Jews who were in Babylon now found themselves in Persia, and those Jews who had been working for the Babylonian government now found themselves under new employment with the Persians, they had a new and different foreign policy. And so the Persian king allowed the Jews to go back. Waves of them had gone back under Ezra. Ezra had spearheaded the rebuilding of the temple and trying to reestablish the worship of the people of God. And yet, Judah and Jerusalem were still a third world country in rubble. No economy, no central government no protection. They had no momentum going for them. Enter Nehemiah. Rebuild square one. What's the first step for you and me in rebuilding? Number one, face current reality. Nehemiah 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned him about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile... So understand, he's talking about those who had been in Babylon. They had now returned back to their homeland. Those who had survived the exile are, and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. And then he said, The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. What the messenger was saying is that the land is devastated. Yes, the temple has been rebuilt. There's a semblance of worship, but there's no way that the country can be rebuilt, no way the city can be inhabited because the walls are down and the gates have been burned with fire. Ancient time, no Fox News, no CNN, no Internet. Persia is a 1,000 miles away from, uh, from Jerusalem. Nehemiah... 
had, had, didn't know anything about what had happened. Well, he knew historically, but he had not been there. He had not been a part of the rebellion of the people of God. He was not there when the city was defeated by the Babylonians. And so he didn't know the condition of the city. The messengers came, and I want you to understand a couple of things here. The messengers did not sugarcoat the message. They said the people of God are in great distress. They are in disgrace. It is a, a deplorable situation, and the center of it all is that the walls are in rubble. They are broken down, and the gates have been burned with fire. Now, the next phrase... In verse 4, it says, when I heard these things. So let me just pause right there. We have that the messengers, the messengers did not sugarcoat the message. And the recipient of the message, Nehemiah, accepted the message. He didn't say, oh, now it can't be that bad. I'm sure it'll get better. Everything will be okay. Here, you guys... Go in and get some refreshments from your long journey. Everything will be okay. i got to get back to work. He didn't spurn them. He didn't put it off. He didn't, he didn't in any way try to make light of the situation. Nehemiah faced current reality. I've observed over the years that as people look to rebuild an area of their life, they have trouble facing current reality. There are three approaches that I've noticed. One is what I call the T-ball approach. My kids both played t-ball. I particularly remember Lori. I don't know if she was four or five, you know, when she started out playing t-ball. But we had a great coach, Coach Joe. He was a member of the church that I was pastoring at that time. And, and honestly, he, he was just, he was the perfect t-ball coach. He was energetic. He was positive. He was upbeat. He encouraged the children. He, in practice, he kept them short. He knew they had very small attention spans. He knew some of them had zero coordination and would never play ball again. But he understood they were out there to have fun. He taught them the fundamentals. He worked with them in practice, but he wasn't overbearing. After the games, by the way, he played everybody. And after the games, he was even kill whether we won or whether we lost. I remember one time... We got beat by 20-something runs. All the teams gathered there, and Coach Joe and the parents, and one little boy said, did we win? <laughs> they didn't even know who won or lost. And Coach Joe says, well, no, not this time, but, but that's okay. You guys played hard. Did you have a good time? Yeah! And guess what? He dismissed them to get their snack and drink, and they all left happy. You know, that's fine when you're a four- or five-year-old playing t-ball. But when you're an adult, results matter. And I've seen too many adults with the t-ball approach sitting in the rubble and eating their life, their marriage, a discipline, a reputation, a career to be rebuilt, and they simply blow it off put a positive spin on it, somehow thinking that things will get better. There's a second approach. It's what I call energetic activism. Now, these are people who go a little bit below the surface about one inch. They're full of energy. They're full of activity. They have this go get them spirit. They look at the rubble of their lives, and they say, okay, Listen, I can do this, I can turn this around, I can rebuild. And they begin to maybe read books, go to conferences. There are certain things they will do with energy and passion. And you look at them and you say, wow, they're really serious about this. But the problem with those who are energetic activists is they will do a lot of things on the surface that will make them feel good emotionally, but they are often unwilling to do or undo that which is primary to changing the situation from rubble to rebuilding. And then there's what I call the fact-based realist. That was Nehemiah. He was not negative. He was not a pessimist. 
It's not that he wasn't optimistic, but he was realistic. He took the facts, he took current reality, and he slowly took it in. If you're going to rebuild in some area of your life, then you need to look at the mirror and look at the facts and don't sugarcoat them. And for some of you, you've had messengers in your life, maybe professionals, maybe family, maybe friends, and they have delivered the message to try to help you deal with current reality, and you have spurned the message and the messengers. Beware. Rebuilding will not happen unless you face current reality. Number two, take your brokenness to the Lord. Verse four, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. In my mind, I put a circle around verse 4, and I write across it, brokenness. We see very little brokenness in the church today. Brokenness is more than being sorry. Oh, I'm sorry about the walls and the gates in Jerusalem, but... That's a thousand miles away. It's more than just feeling guilty. Brokenness is more than just being heartbroken. Brokenness is a spiritual condition where one personalizes the circumstances and situation. They embrace it. They identify with it. And if there's sin, there's confession and repentance. There is a spiritual brokenness before God. That was Nehemiah. You say, well, Howard, I've got some issues in my life. I've got some rebuilding to do. I'm trying to face current reality, but I can't say I'm really broken. Let me, let me share with you three things. Number one, wait. Wait before God. Psalm 27, 14, wait before the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait before the Lord. That's what Nehemiah did. Do, do you pick up on what happened in verse 4? I sat down, and then in the next sentence, for some days. Nehemiah was taking his brokenheartedness to God. He didn't know where to turn. He didn't know what to do. And he sat before God. When was the last time that you were so confounded and broken over something, you didn't know what to do? So often, what do we want to do? We want to rush out and do something. Sometimes we just need to wait before God in meditation. Alan Redpath, a preacher from yesteryear, wrote, There's too much work before men and too little waiting before God. Wait. Number two, weep. Weep. Nehemiah, the scripture says, wept, and he mourned. When was the last time in brokenness over some cracks, some breaches in your spiritual walls, sin in your life, that in prayer... You shed tears, wept before God. Jesus looked out over Jerusalem, and he cried. 
in brokenness. And he said, man, I've longed to save you and, and to take you like a mother hen would take, take her chicks and put you under my wing, but you wouldn't have anything to do with me. Brokenness. When was the last time you wept over your church? In a real sense, this intentional interim process is about laying the foundation to rebuild. Nehemiah was not defensive. Nehemiah did not blame. Nehemiah was broken. He wept before God, and he wailed. The Scripture says he prayed. I, I think at this point, Nehemiah was not saying, okay, God, what do you want me to do? How are we going to resurrect this situation? I think he was just so brokenhearted, he was just following Psalm 55, 22. Cast your care on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. I don't believe that we will see a revival in America until we see a broken church brokenness over sin, brokenness over the culture. We can blame Congress and the president and schools. And, but when are we going to look at ourselves and say, we have not done our job? The classic example is David. David lowered the walls. And he looked with lust on Bathsheba, summoned her to the palace. Don't, by any stretch of the imagination, think that Bathsheba was not guilty. She went. One night stand, she got pregnant cover-up plan didn't work, so sent her husband, one of his top 30 soldiers, into the front of the battle, had the general withdraw, just set him up so that he was killed in battle. Many historians believe, as could have been maybe a year or so went by, David was callous. After all, he was the king. He could do whatever he wanted, right? Until finally, Nathan the prophet shared the word of the Lord through a parable, and it all came down to his bony finger pointing at David and saying, you are the man. God broke David's heart. and We have that prayer of brokenness in Psalm 51. Verse 17, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Face current reality. Take your brokenness to the Lord and seek the Lord's guidance in prayer. That's what we have in, in verses 5 through 11 we have Nehemiah saying, okay, God, where do we go from here? What is it you want me to do? Verse 5. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven and the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself, 
My father's family have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Several things about this prayer. First of all, he started out praising God. Started out praising God, the God of heaven who is great and awesome, the faithful God who keeps his covenant. Talked about that last Sunday. Matt made reference to that this morning. He started out praising God. And then notice, he asked God to hear and asked God to draw near. And notice the persistency in prayer. This was not a one-shot prayer. Day and night, there was a period of time, there was persistence that he had been praying. And then he identified with the people. Notice the language. He said, I confess the sins, we Israelites, including myself. What would you have done? Think about this. Nehemiah wasn't even alive when, when the kings of Israel began to rebel against God. He wasn't there when the judgment came through the Babylonian army. But rather than criticize or cast blame or scapegoat, Nehemiah saw himself as part of the family of God. He was a Jew. He was part of the family of God. And he says, I have a part in this. I have, I have contributed to this. My family has contributed to this because we have not kept your commands and been totally, totally obedient to you. And then he sought the Lord's will as he claimed the promise of God. Remember? Remember what the Lord said to Solomon? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, remember, if this happens, I will heal you. I will heal your land. I will restore you. Remember, Nehemiah claimed the promise of God in prayer. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. There's so many promises in the Word of God that, that apply to the rubble of your life, to where you need rebuilding. Claim those promises in prayer. And, and then, he, then he sought the Lord's will, and, and he was willing to do whatever God had for him. Psalm 25 and verse 4, show me your ways, teach me your paths, guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior and my hope is in you all day long. But what we do is we get our plan and then we say, God, I want you to bless my plan. It's a neat little plan. I think you'll agree so if you'll just make it work. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Not Howard's purpose, not your purpose, not your plans, not my plans, but God's plan. Matthew 7, 7 and 8, Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. So the answer comes to the doors open, that he shows his way. Seek the Lord's guidance in prayer. And then move out of your comfort zone. I've been waiting for this. This is my favorite point in the message, so I had to get through the rest of it just to get to this. Move out of your comfort zone. Notice, notice what happened here at the end of verse 11. 
Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. So let's talk about this for a minute. Nehemiah is leaking out to us a spirit and an attitude that he was willing to move out of his comfort zone. And really from that verse, the rest of the book unfolds. So Nehemiah was the cupbearer. So that's the first thing he's telling us about his position, his security. He was more than a dishwasher or a butler. He had a palace position in civil service. He had, I mean, yeah, he had to drink the wine and taste the food to be sure it wasn't poisoned. But he probably had servants underneath him. He probably oversaw what was happening in the kitchen behind the scenes. He had wardrobe. He had housing. He had assets. He had benefits. Nehemiah had it made. But Nehemiah was saying to you and me, he was saying... I'm willing to risk it all to move out of my comfort zone for the people of God and for the kingdom of God. We all have our comfort zones, don't we? All of us. The preacher, the deacons, we all do. So let me just name some comfort zones this morning. How about where you sit in church? Some people sit on the my left side, some people sit on the right, some people sit in the back, some people sit in the front. Even though from time to time we have special events and move pews around, and so the pew you're sitting in after an event might not be the same pew. You call it your pew. Even though it's the church's pew, it is not really your pew. But if the church starts growing... And guests come, and somebody sits in your, quote, pew, what then? Comfort zone alert. <laughs> Had that happen several times at South Park. And the last straw came when some guests came in and set their Bible and purse and stuff down where uh, this couple always sat. And you know what they did? Our members moved their stuff. No, 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 no joke. And the guests came, and they were like, I know we put our stuff down here. And, and finally our member says, oh, you were in our spot. We, we moved them. So that was the last straw. Monday morning, Howard went to war sent out this little communication to the church that that would never happen again and that if you, if you were known by me to be in that situation, you'd probably want to turn and run. <laughs> oh, here's another comfort zone issue. How about the music you like? Ah, not as many laughs there. Now we're getting serious. Some people like and could be just cool with the hymns all the time. Other people like contemporary blend. Some of you really prefer contemporary rock, Christian rock. Churches do all kinds of things today. You know, the real question is not your preference or mine. The real question is how are we going to make disciples? How are we going to reach people for Jesus Christ? I had some slaying of, 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 of things in my life that had to take place when God began to do some things in spite of me at South Park. And I got to a point where I didn't care how people dressed. I didn't really care that much about the music as long as it was, you know, uh, biblical and, you know, theologically sound and well-planned and done. I didn't care if they brought coffee in church and spilled it on the carpet. There are so many things that I said, I really don't care anymore because God is blessing and the church is growing. 
I'm talking personalization comfort zones for me that grew up in a very traditional church. Oh, here's another one. How about your thing in the church? Whatever that is. Your ministry, your thing, whatever it is you've always done. And then when new pastor comes in after Howard and you go into the office and you say, this is my thing, this is my passion, this is what I'm going to do. And he says, well, we're not going to do that anymore. Would you mind doing this? Because I think it'll be more effective. Comfort zone alert. Hello. We all have our comfort zones, don't we? Acknowledge it. But folks, if you're going to rebuild in some area that's in rubble in your life, if we're going to rebuild this church with God's grace and power, we've got to move out of our comfort zones. Nehemiah was saying, I'm willing to move out of my comfort zone for the sake of the kingdom of God. What's the condition of your walls? God knows. Isaiah 59 Verse 16. Isaiah 49, verse 16. There we go. See, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. He knows. He knows. By the way... Jesus Christ is the master rebuilder. When you think about it, he was in heaven and he faced current reality that his creation was separated from him by sin and there's nothing that we could do about it. Broken, destined for hell. He followed the plan of God and Jesus left the comfort zone of heaven to come to the rubble of earth and became a servant and as a servant he died on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins why so that he might through his grace and power that our relationship with him might be rebuilt reconciled and revived take your rubble to Jesus look to him lean on him learn from him and he will help you rebuild Jesus, we look to you. You are the master architect. You're the Savior. You're our Lord and our God, the head of the church and the Savior of the body. And Lord, in so many ways, all of us, whether great or small, we need some walls to be rebuilt, some disciplines to be restored. God, you know every person here and what needs to happen in their, their spiritual lives. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would move and work and, in a powerful way. And God, that you would give us conviction and courage and faith and trust in you to move out of our comfort zones and to take up our crosses and follow you. And I pray these things, Jesus, in your awesome and powerful and holy and righteous name. And God's people said together, Amen. Let's stand, let's sing, let's begin the process of rebuilding. Mm -hmm.